out to search for the child, to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was what was fulfilled as spoken by the Lord through the prophet of Egypt, I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around that time, who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Thus was fulfilled as spoken to the prophet Jeremiah. The voice was heard in her mouth, while wailing a lot of lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled, because they are no more. When Herod died, the angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in the dream of Joseph to Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are seeking the child's life are dead. And Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when Herod got away, he was going to go to Judea and face his father Herod. He was afraid to go there. And after he mourned and grieved, he went away to the Galilee. There he was home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. He will be called Nazarene. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Well, I won't say I hate to be the bearer of bad news, it's just the truth, but friends, it is August. How has the summer flown by? I was talking with a mom this week, and now that it's August, reality has hit that this is the month that she moves her oldest child to college. It's really happening. She and I talked about how scary it is to pack up and move off, especially to a faraway land and a place where you don't know a soul. I've done it a few times in my life, and in each leaving, I remember crying and sobbing to my mother, how will I live without these friends? How will I go on? To which my mother would always remind me, remember, You didn't even know these people existed two years ago, and now you can't live without them. Who are you to not trust that that will happen again? And it did. Every time. Moving from Boston to Ashland, Montana, and Ashland, Montana to New Haven, Connecticut, and New Haven, Connecticut to Berkeley, California, and Berkeley, California to Amor, Minnesota, and Amor, Maconia, and Maconia to Billings, Each time has started with fear and trepidation. And each time has started with sweaty move-ins, because why do we always move in the height of August heat and humidity? Each time has started with buying new microwaves, because they're so cheap it's not worth using up the space in your car for a microwave. And each time I fear I will never have another friend ever. At least no one as good as the ones I've left behind. And yes, like my mother predicted, everywhere I've moved, I've made friends that enrich my life and make me laugh and cry with me over Hallmark commercials or real actual traumas, depending on the day. It's gone so well in my favor that in this last move, I even married one of the new people. Billings has been good to me in that way. And because of that fortuitous Billings and the marriage and the two kids that came after, I got to play the role of mother two weeks ago today. As I drove my kids up to Flathead Lake to attend Flathead Lutheran Bible Camp, it was the first time there for all three of us, and all three of us had our own nerves and excitements. And my dear, sweet daughter was the most vocal in her concerns. What if I don't make any friends? What if there's no one in my cabin who's into what I'm into? What if no one is fun? And channeling Mother Linda in my head, I assured her that she would find her people. And a week from now, she'd be crying that she couldn't live without them. 
And happy doesn't feel like the right word, but I am happy to report that last weekend she was indeed in tears over leaving her new camp friends. And that it's a whole year, mother, until I can go back. It's about the people. You'll find good people. So this week in summer Sunday school, we're reminded of a story that normally we talk about with good people, the mangers and the angels and the shepherds and the wise men. But our story today reminds us that after we sing the songs of silent night and joy to the world, immediately following, Immediately following the warm, fuzzy glow of nativity goodness comes the brokenness of the world Christ was born to save. Our new father, Joseph, is warned in a dream that his child's life is in danger. That an unfriendly ruler threatened him would do anything to do in his power to destroy the threat. Your child is in danger. In danger of by a ruthless man who holds all the cards and all the power and all the corrupt privilege and you're the only person who can keep your child safe. What an awful gut-wrenching sickening scenario. I can't imagine anything worse. And I have the privilege of not ever having to imagine it at all. I just got to take my kids to camp. This is Joseph's reality. And not this alone. Because the ruthless, awful ruler, ruler followed through. He yielded his power for evil, and parents lost their children. A lot of them. There is still the weeping and lamentation in that land. But Joseph had one. And like the others, he had warning, and so he fled and sought refuge, and leading Mary and the infants Jesus into Egypt, they became refugees. Strangers in a foreign land because home wasn't safe, and home was no longer good, and home could kill their child. And so they became refugees. And now, because this is summer Sunday school, we need to do a quick refresher of the many layers of the story. Because Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus himself were Jewish. They were followers of the God of Abraham and Isaac, of Jacob and Joseph and his brothers, and Naomi and Ruth and Elijah and Elisha and Ezekiel and Nehemiah and Esther and Job. And they would have known the stories of the Hebrew Bible, of the Old Testament, as we call it. And yet, with all this knowledge and knowing all these stories, when home wasn't safe and when his child was his friend, Joseph packed up Mary and Jesus and went to Egypt. Egypt? Because if he knew the story of Abraham and Isaac and Ruth and Naomi and Esther and Job, my goodness, he would have known the story of Moses. And still, home wasn't safe. When his child's life was in danger, he went to Egypt. Even when he knew the story of Moses, a Jewish child who lived in Egypt as a slave to Pharaoh, as one in captivity, as one who survived a threat on his own life, as just a little baby, a threat to power and privilege, when Moses was born, Pharaoh had ordered the death of all Jewish boys to and under, and now who remembers in Sunday school how Moses survived? Do you remember the basket in the river? His mom placed her baby in a basket in a river. 
and sent his young sister to watch as the midwives pulled him out. And he grew up and he spent his adult life then coming into his identity and fighting against the powers that tried to silence him and his people and his God until he yelled at Pharaoh, let my people go. And he led them to the promised land, the promised land where they were led, where they were to be safe from that threat. But first, for 40 years, they too were refugees. Refugees in limbo, waiting and longing and hoping in wilderness until they got a home that was new to them. Home for that people, but now a home that was no longer safe for Joseph and Mary and Jesus, who was our Savior. So they had to flee and seek refuge and find safety anywhere but home. Even if that meant Egypt. And that is a reminder for us all it's not an accident. It's a reminder for us all that no place and no people are all bad. No place and no people are all bad. God can lead us anywhere and help us find safety. In teaching Sunday school on this story, I could have written a whole semester's worth, weeks and weeks and months, on the idea of stranger and other and outcast and foreigner and refugee in God's scripture. So much of God's stories are told through the lens of a people and a place and identity that comes with that. So much of God's story is about leaving home and finding home and taking home from others and sharing your home with others. In the scripture, there's so much glory and there is so much shame in being a people from a place. How good to be a Judean, how awful. Don't drink water from her, she's touched that. Even a Nazarene can speak truth. You must be with him for your Nazarene. You could spend hours on these stories. Except that in Christ Jesus, they are meant to stop. They are meant to be over and done with. Because the baby that was born in Bethlehem, who was a refugee in Egypt, who made a new home in a nowhere town in Nazareth, and traveled through Judea all of his adult life, who was killed by the powers of the government in Jerusalem, this baby grew up to tell us enough. Enough. It's about people. And the heart and the goodness and the beloved nature of people who are all God's children. Every one. No longer stranger. No longer foreigner. No longer outcast, but room for everyone at the table. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in the place of two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death the hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who are far off, and peace also to those who are near, for through him both of us have access to one spirit and Father. So then you are no longer strangers or aliens. You are citizens of the saints and also members of the household of God upon built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, as Jesus himself is the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. It's 
Friends, it is true. The world has not caught up to Jesus yet. But as Christians, we can and we should. And as Christians, we must. We know that for all that divides us, what draws us together is stronger. That for all those who claim to follow Jesus, it means that we must, we absolutely must, see every person as neighbor. And every person as friend. And as Christians, we must will and wish for every other person in this world what we will and wish for ourselves and our loved ones. And that, only that, is to live as the one who died on a cross in Jerusalem has asked us to do. The good news is, the opportunities to do so are everywhere. It's okay to be nervous about doing it. But trust me, Trust Linda, she knows a thing or two, I guess. And ask Marit, because you might just be crying with joy for the new people in your life after you dare put yourself out there in love. In Christ's love. Because in Christ there is no longer stranger but only friend.